Um, thanks, Yvonne. Thanks for to Texas State, the Department of Philosophy. Who else has sponsored this? Department of History. Department of History. Department of English. English. Gender and Multicultural Center, the Multicultural Affairs Office of the Dean, the Honors College, the College of Arts and Sciences. Goodness me. The Liberal Arts. The Liberal Arts. Well, thank you all very much for having me. It's a pleasure. I always love coming and talking about Aztecs. Um, the title of this is Weaving the Cosmos. I guess I should have my name there. Let me see if I can get this. Um, and I'm looking in particular at metaphysics uh, for the Aztecs. Um, real briefly, I'm referring to the Fifth Age, as I'll talk about later, or you can make me talk about more in the Q&A section. The Aztecs saw the history of the cosmos is going through four, um, five distinct eras, ages, or what I pref prefer to call sun-earth orderings. And we currently live in the fifth, and the fifth is the last one. Um, so that was a cause of great anxiety and torment for the Aztecs. Um, let's see, this all works. So here's my understanding of metaphysics, just a brief pretty neutral um, definition of metaphysics taken from Western philosophy. Theory of the nature, structure, and ultimate constituents of reality. So how is reality put together? So that's what I'm looking at. I'm talking about the Aztecs, but really properly speaking, I'm talking about the Nahua, N-A-H-U-A, because the Nahua were the, um, the Aztecs were one amongst many Nahua, or Nahuat, N-A-H-U-A-T-L, um, Nahuatl-speaking peoples in the central high plateau of Mexico. They just happen to be the most famous and the ones we know the best. The word Aztec, as I recall, was invented in the late 19th century. I can't forget, I can't remember the inventor, but it wasn't their term. They referred to themselves as the Mexica or the Tenocha. Um, but so, but sort of for popularity's sake, you have to put Aztec there, otherwise no one knows who you're talking about. But really I'm talking about Nahuatl-speaking people in the high central plateau and in the Valley of Mexico in particular. So I want to look at how they put together the world. Um, so I'll proceed. So I, like of all, a lot of other scholars, argue that at the base, at the, the, the heart of um, Aztec metaphysics is this notion of teot. Right, the L doesn't get pronounced when it's at the end of a word. Um, so, and they conceive Teot as the sacred energy power or force. Um, its sacredness was a function of its power. And because of its power, it was awesome, it was worthy of reverence, it was frightening, it was amazing. Um, and everything turns out to be sacred on this view. Even, uh, so there really is no sacred profane distinction as there is in lots of Western religions. Um, we can talk about that more later. So you've got this notion that the, there exists only one thing, ontological monism claims there exists only one thing, it's teot, this energy, this power, this force. Constitutional monism claims that everything is made up of, constituted by just one kind of stuff. So you have one thing in the world, teot, and everything's made up of teot. Okay, so um, everything around you is simply teot, is the power. And everything that exists, exists only because it has the power to make things happen. To be is to be effective, to be um, causally operative on this view. S this sort of a view is shared throughout a lot of Mesoamerica. You can also find, I think, um, a view like this in indigenous North American philosophies. Okay, the metaphysics, the world is non-hierarchical. This contrasts with most Western metaphysics, starting with Plato and most re uh, Western religions coming out that are influenced by Plato. This notion that there's a great scale of being, as Arthur Lovejoy puts it, there's the higher and the lower. The higher you get, the more real you are, the more is you've got, the more reality you've got. Think of Plato, you've got the forms, they're permanent, eternal, everlasting, immutable. They are the really real, and down here it's the semi-real, it's a realm of appearances. So you've got this hierarchy in religions, the higher up you go towards the transcendent, towards God, the more real you get, the more you come down here, the more illusory you get. So, but this is radically non-hierarchical. So one of the fun things, for me at least, with my training in Western metaphysics, is trying to flesh out lots of concepts 
when you've got a view which is radically non-hierarchical. There will be talk about layers of the cosmos, but the layers are not hierarchically ordered. There's not an ontological distinction between higher and lower animals, higher, you know, God, angels, animals, I mean, humans, animals, plants, rocks, that sort of thing. Oops. Oh, I don't want to. Okay. Given that this tail is this sacred energy, power, motion, it's always in motion. So we've got what Western metaphysics, metaphysicians call a process metaphysics, which is to say that the reality is ultimately a process. The ultimate building blocks, actually the blocks word doesn't work very well, are processes. So things like enduring substances, things, entities, are not the ultimate building blocks. That would be a substance metaphysics. Like tables and chairs, if you think of like Aristotelian metaphysics, the world's made up of stuff. Tables, chairs, rocks, mountains, and, there, and those substances or those entities or things may go through changes, but they are the ultimate building blocks of the cosmos. And we think about the world in terms of things, of entities. But for the Aztecs or the Nahuas, generally, I think they, the, what's at bottom are processes. Tailed is energy, and energy is always in motion. Things are always in change, always in flux. So you have a very nice twist because in Western metaphysics you have this idea that to be real is to be permanent, to be unchanging, right? There's an equation with, to, with reality and immutability and being, right? Think of Plato's forms, think of God. They're there, they're unchanging, they're immutable. They never, they don't become, they don't develop. They are perfect in that sense, yeah? Um, but for the Aztecs, to be real is to change. It is to move. It is to become. It is to transform. It is to, right, to become something different. So everything's in flux, right? And it would, and on this view, therefore, in terms of metaphysics, it has an emphasis and the influence on wisdom. The Aztecs consider it to be pure folly to seek some higher realm in which. You know, think about we're all supposed to go to heaven after we die, where nothing ever changes, where everything's perfect and eternal. And that's just pure folly. Human beings are in and of the world, and the world is one of flux, right? We're, it's in, we're always changing, everything is always changing. So living wisely is going to be a matter of figuring out how to navigate the flux properly, how to navigate and manipulate change in a way that, for them, maximizes a life of a genuinely human life and a life that minimizes pain, suffering, and sorrow. So we've got this idea that to, to be real is to change, is to become. Once again, if you think of Platonic metaphysics, is sort of like the paradigm opposite. For Plato, everything around here changes and therefore it's not fully real, right? Think about, I mean, we all still retain these ideas in a lot of contemporary discourse. Real love is eternal love. Right? Real love is love that never dies. If you really love me, you will love me forever. Right? We've still got that. To be real is never to change. It's to be there always. Right? And if you aren't, then you're a fair weather friend. A fair weather, you know, come and go, thick or thin. But for the Aztecs, everything's changing and everything's moving. So it's just silly to look outside of that to try to find some anchor or rock of ages, as we like to say in the West, right? Because even the rocks are changing, right? Okay, so oh, another feature of this is the notion that reality is ineliminably, I like that word, uh, ambiguous, um, which is to say that, I'll actually explain this more in a little later, but there's this idea in Western metaphysics that, once again, Plato's the paradigm here, Right, think of like the, you know, the, the form of blueness or chairness for Plato. It's pure blue and nothing else. It's clear cut, it's unambiguous. There's a single way the world is for Plato or for Aristotle. And it's pretty much the guiding assumption of most Western science is that there's a single way the world is. There's an order to the world, a structure, and there's only one way. And science is out to discover that way. And if we come across ambiguity in our studies, it means we're confused. Because the world is unambiguous, the ambiguity is up here. It's an epistemological problem, a problem in the shortcoming in our knowledge. But for the Aztecs, the world itself, reality is ambiguous, right? So this totally like scrambles, turns on its head a lot of Western metaphysics and the, me the metaphysics that most Western science presupposes. Maybe you think 
some contemporary physics has gone this way. I'll talk more about that too. And then finally we've got a holism that pretty much goes with the ontological monism and the constitutional monism, namely that you've got this large single whole and everything is interrelated. It's this grand, you know, you can think of that as an organic whole or you can think of that as a grand ecology, but everything is interrelated. Everything is sort of interfused with everything else. Everything's interrelated with everything else, mutually affecting and mutually influencing. So you don't have this tidy little world. Okay, let's see. So I think, right, borrowing a word from the West, the view is pantheistic. For those of you who know Western philosophy, I think someone who comes close to this is, is Spinoza, or for Eastern, maybe Taoism. It depends on who you, you, your interpreter. But here's a definition of pantheism I've taken from a guy named Michael Levine on a book called Pantheism recently. He defines pantheon as everything that exists constitutes an all-inclusive and interrelated unity. This unity is sacred. Everything that exists is substantively identical with and constituted by the sacred. The sacred is, this is my addition, teot. There is only one thing, teot, and all other aspects or forms of reality and existence are identical with it. And teot is not a minded being, agent, god, or divinity. Right, and there he differs from Spinoza. So Teot is just this, this energy, right? Everything is animated by this. Everything is vivified by it and enlivened by it. So you have what Western anthropologists or philosophers would call animism, but the term doesn't really work very well because we think of animism, right? It's a trousers word. It's a binary of inanimate. We think animism is that silly view where you put spirits in tables and chairs and rocks. But that isn't really what the Aztecs are talking about, spirit or psyche. They're talking about everything consists of this dynamic energy in motion. It's alive in that sense. It's causally effective. It moves things and it is affected by things, right? Even rocks, trees, mountains, oceans, they're all alive and they've got power because one, they affect one another and they even affect us in perception. So they've got power and energy. So everything is on this view. Um, animated in, with scare quotes around it, and sacred. A very interesting, one of my favorite um, sort of chapters in Aztec philosophy, there's, I'm sort of going from the talk here since Ivan gave me more time. There are one of the, the, the various um, so-called gods of the Aztec pantheism, I don't think are really gods. I think this whole view of the Aztec pantheism is an invention of the of the first um, Franciscans and Dominicans who went there. And they went there and they tried to understand, <coughs> excuse me, the Aztecs in terms of what they knew best. And what they knew best was the Roman pantheon. So they started likening all the so-called Aztec deities or divinities in terms of, uh, um, you know, Jupiter or Mercury. And they carved them up. But it turns out that these, the various Aztec deities are in fact just names for sort of clusters of what we would call natural processes. So like Tlaloc, T-L-A-O-L-T-L-A-L-O-C. It's just a name for a cluster of natural processes. I hesitate to say natural because natural is the trouser words with supernatural, and there is no natural supernatural view on, distinction on this view. Everything well, they don't make the distinction. They would see it as a false distinction. The world around us is not nature as we understand it. I mean, it, because there is no supernatural realm far away where the gods live. This is where everything is. This is where Teot is. You're in the middle of the supernatural slash natural all the time. So the names of various deities like Quetzalcoatl or Tlaloc just name clusters of energies and they get named that way and these clusters get segregated the way they are for ritual purposes. If we're suffering drought, then we want to direct our ritual activities towards Tlaloc, who is the bringer of rain. Okay? And through these ritual activities, they're not ritual in the usual anthropological sense of sort of mindless, repetitive activities. They're, they're avenues or they're means by which the Aztecs causally participate in the cosmos. Human beings have an ability to make things happen, to affect the world, maybe like we think global warming is. So what they do is they carve out from this big total whole particular manageable aspects for ritual purposes. And they give it a name. And that just, is, I think it's just a name 
for this cluster and it's useful for ritual purposes. But at the end of the day, and as most Mesoamerican scholars point out, they all bleed or fuse into one another after all. They're all ambiguous. They all have everybody else in them. It's all very, very blurry. There are no clear-cut distinctions. One of these, my very favorite, is I guess she's, uh, it's a she, she's g primarily gendered female, is, is, uh, is called Tlatzol Teot. And Tlatzol, T-L-A-Z-O-L, and then Teot, re it means basically sacred filth. And Tlatzol Teot is all about um, filth. It's about um, excrement, about mucus, about things that are disordered and ill-placed and stuff out of place like blood on the, f no, not blood, I won't leave blood out, about mucus, semen, um, uh, everything that's worn out, filth, humus, excrement, all of this stuff is, you know, it's basically shit, yeah? Okay, so, so this, this, this deity's name is basically sacred shit, and you go, wow, shit, how can that be sacred? But, I mean, if you think in Western Christianity, the, the sacred's up here with God, and the, down here in the, the moribund of the physical world, it's all basically profane. Why is it profane? Because it's filthy and dirty. But the Aztecs have this very keen sense of ecology, our term, that of course you can't have plants and you can't have life without humus. You need excrement. You need the fertilizer for your plants. So of course that stuff's sacred. It's part of this whole cyclical whole. You need that stuff. So Tlatzolteot is sacred shit. Shit is sacred, right? You need that stuff in order to live. And it plays a vital role in the overall ecology of the cosmos. And it's therefore sacralized. So that, I mean, I think very dramatically illustrates how there is no sacred profane distinction as we understand it coming out of the West. Everything is sacred, even the stuff on the floor, dirt, filth, you know, poop, mucus, anything sort of like disorderly, messy, sloppy. You need it. Okay, so everything is basically sacred. And if there is going to be what we would think of as a sacred profane distinction, it ends up being unpacked non-hierarchically in terms of whether or not things are well arranged or poorly arranged. And the Aztecs are obsessed with arranging things, with ordering things. And the better ordered it is, and the better arranged it is, the more sort of sacred it is. It, we have a horizontal continuum where the, where the badly arranged, the malarranged, and the disordered over here, and the well arranged over here. And they're always trying to keep things together, keep things stuff in place, well ordered and well arranged. Okay, I, okay. One of the key pieces or components of Aztec metaphysics is this notion of an enomic. And literally in Nahuatl, the S is my edition, enomic means its match. And so, and for a lot of this work, what I've been doing is going back to the, the conquest era sources and the dictionaries and pretty much doing what I learned a long time ago is linguistic analysis and conceptual analysis. Looking at Aztec, Nahuatl concepts, seeing how they're used and, and trying to unpack their metaphysics from their language, from the concepts. So enomics is this notion of a match. And everything in the world has a match. I mean, you think about you know, your sparring partner or your, a tennis match, um, your, a boxing partner. Um, there are various things you mate your match. There's this idea that things are matched up with something else. So they're matched, uh, polar is my word, forces that are simultaneously mutually complementary, mutually arising, mutually interdependent, and mutually competitive. And then they're also alternatingly dominating. Um, and they're neither, by Western logical definitions, contraries nor contradictories. So you've got a variety of, I'll give you examples here, like male-female. You've got everything in the world is, it consists of both male-female components. No matter how you divide me into various parts, each one of my subparts is, has a match. Even my male viral member, as they say, has a female component to it. Everything has both. So here you have this notion of this irreducible, ineliminable ambiguity of things. Everything is both things at the same time. But they're both things in a very odd way. They're, these things, 
let me think of, let me give you a picture and I'll go back to here. Here's a very famous um, life death mask. These are duality masks. You can get them in Mexico all the time. But this one comes from Tlatilco, um, just north of Mexico City. And what the Aztecs are trying to do or, um, is try to show you that life and death are enomics. They're mutually arising, mutually interdependent. Um, and what's the other word I want? Mutually complementary. They form a single whole, which is this unified duality or a sort of a dualized unity. And this figure is trying to show you that life emerges from death and death emerges from life. And that you can't have life without death and you can't have death without life. That's why the silly of eternal life where nobody ever dies is just foolish. Without something dying, we don't live, right? Every time you eat, you're killing something. Life depends upon death. So life and death are always going back and forth like this, much like some people think yin and yang do in Taoism. But you've got this notion of this interdependency, that you can't have one without the other. They arise out of one another. Life springs from death, and death springs from life, right? That sacred humus, tlatzolteo, that dead stuff. Life emerges from that stuff, you, right? That it's fertilizer. So these, mats, these masks try to, to, I think, pictorially try to express this philosophical concept of mutual, um, mutual arising, complementarity, and interdependence. But they also, they also add an additional element, which is the Greek word would be agon or agon, which is struggle. There's always a fight going on between life and death. But it's very nice, it's not a struggle to the death in which one side tries to eliminate the other, like life will triumph over death at the end of history. Or if you think of Near Eastern Manichaeanism or Zoroastrianism, you have life versus dark, life versus um, death, you know, good versus evil, and these are struggling in this cosmic battle back and forth. And at the end of history, one is going to win out and triumph. That's just silly by the Aztec lights. They're there always going on. Life, death, life, death. It's an unending, unceasing struggle. And for certain moments, right, life dominates death, but it never extinguishes it. Because without death, you don't get life, right? And death will momentarily triumph and dominate life, but it can't do that permanently, and it can't eliminate life because you don't get death without something alive dying. So you've got this agon or the struggle going on. So the history of the cosmos and the history of everything around you is this constant struggle between these enomics. So we've got a variety of enomics down sort of, they're male, female. I've used a tilde from Spanish to, 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 to refer to the, uh, the relationship rather than a slash or a dash. Um, I picked this convention up from, I can't remember who. Um, but it's a way of saying that, you know, they're joined with one another. They're, they're matches of one another. Light, death, hot, cold, light, darkness, dry, wet, order, disorder, being, non-being, arrangement, derangement. So being and non-being, they're always going back and forth. Life, death, they're always going back and forth. And they're not going anywhere, right? Um, we've got here, it's non-eschatological, it's non-teleological. This process isn't going anywhere. There's no end to history, there's no telos, no purpose, no final destiny. There's just the endless, right, going back and forth between life, death, life, death, being, non-being, being, non-being, non right? It just goes on and on and on. We're going nowhere. It's no, but a lot of, you know, Westerners freak out at the idea that, you know, history's not progressing to some point, but it's really no more upsetting than just the change of the seasons. Right? Winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall. Do you freak out when you go, wow, oh man, winter. It's, there's no end to this stuff. And then spring, it just happens. For them, it's just a wet and a dry season, right? Wet, dry, wet, dry, and it just, just goes on, right? And you know the yin-yang circle with a little S curve in it. If you were to animate that and put it and roll it, that's pretty much what I think Lao Tzu is trying to talk about. So these enomics represent two aspects or facets of Teot, just in the way that mind, body, or different aspects or facets of God for Spinoza. They're not two different substances. They're not essentially different. Okay, this is still Teot. And it's just a brute fact about the cosmos that Teot expresses itself this way, presents itself this way. Right? 
After that, there is no why. That's just the way it is. Um, neither of these is ontologically or conceptually privileged over the other. Like in the beginning, there wasn't life and then death, or in the beginning, there wasn't disorder and chaos, and then God came and created order, right, as lots of Western cosmo cosmologists argue. For the Aztecs and for most Mesoamericans generally, in the beginning, there was du this duality. There was always male-female. There was always light-dark. They were always there, and they always have been. They're just going like this, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Because to say in the beginning was disorder is to privilege it, right? Or to say in the beginning there was God and there was some order is to privilege that, and neither of these is privileged. Okay. So... They, they unite to form a dynamic and ambiguous singularity, a dual singularity or, an, or a unified duality. Latin here, a tertium quid, a third thing. So being and non-being are dynamics that unite to form becoming. And so one of the defining characteristics of reality is becoming. It's not a metaphysics of being, it's a metaphysics of becoming. So this, this constant back and forth between being, non-being, being, non-being non -being really creates something, a third kind of thing, which is becoming, which is process, which is change. So if you try to put reality into one or the other of these, you misunderstand it. So that explains partly, well, um, totally why the world is this process, why it's in a constant state of flux and becoming, because you've got this constant alternation between being, non-being, being, being non-being. So actually, all of these anomics, male, female, life, death, all form, strictly speaking, a tertium quid, a third thing, but uh, we don't have the words for it. I mean, becoming is very nice because it's different from being and non-being. We have a third word for that, but we don't have a third word for hot, cold, light, darkness, male, female. Um, so let's see. Let me go to these. So what, here's another one from Soil Tepec. Um, it's a Zapotec, life, death, mask. This one, just like the one from Tlatilco, right, it's trying to show the unified duality, right? That life, death form a unified whole. And that you don't understand things if you get just one half of the mask. Um, and these have this great feature is that they seem to be aptly described in the following way. They're neither life, alive nor dead, yet both alive and dead at the same time. So they're neither wholly alive nor wholly dead, but they are both alive and dead at the same time. They sort of occupy this very ambiguous status by our lights. And I should emphasize, I guess, the ambiguity is our, our problem. I'm not sure they think about things in terms of ambiguity. So there, I mean, you can also, and these, these the enomics pretty much align with one another, like um, hot aligns with male, cold aligns with female, Wet aligns with female and cold, hot, dry align with male. So all these anomics end up sort of lining with one another. Gender is part of it, but it's not the whole, whole part of it. Um, and it turns out that everything is interrelated in these ways. And you and I are all interrelated. I can have, and things are very flux, I can have a various a match, for example, as, uh, as, the, my, as a man of the house, I'm sort of and a male related to my wife, who's a female, my female enamic. Let's see, if I'm, let's see, if I'm from Tlaxcala, and I'm a warrior who goes to battle with the Tenocha, the Aztecs, I am now a female, because the Aztecs view alien warriors as female. So I'm both male and female, male in my house, yet female vis-a-vis -vis or relative to the Tenocha warrior, the Mexica warrior, who I meet in the, on the battlefield. So everything is ambiguous in this way, and everything, I can both be male and female at the same time, depending upon my particular match. And I'm interrelated with everything, so I'm sort of exhaustively right, defined in this way. Here's a... a, a a picture from a, a pictoglyph from the Codex. Um, my brain's not working. I can't remember the Codex. But here you have on your right, you have Quetzalcoatl. Um, and on the left is Miklantecutli, Lord of the Underworld, or Death God, if we want to talk about that. But I mean, Miklan means death, and Tecutli just means Lord or Honorable. So here you have life and death, and they're joined at the spine. 
And one of the words, if you go into Molina, Molina's dictionary, um, one of the uses of enomics is for two fields to come back to back and share a wall in common. So in this way, I think they're trying to you know, portray, depict, convey the idea of this enomic, agonistic enomic duality, that these things are linked together by the spine. They share a common backbone. Oftentimes they're, they're um, depicted facing one another, and that's a very other common motif for depicting enomics face to face. Um, husbands and wives are commonly depicted facing one another in the codices. Do I have any more of these? No. Okay, let's see. So at the very bottom, we've got the following are, are, are not included in these enomics. One, good and evil. So central to Western religion and metaphysics, this notion of good and evil, they're just not there. They're arranged things and they're malarranged things. They're ordered things and disordered things, but there is no such thing as goodness or evil as such. They're just not part of their worldview, how they, their horizon. That's a big difference. Um, because, I mean, death isn't good and death isn't evil, right? Death is both good and bad, right? For, at least from a human point of view, we don't want to die, but also we need it because we got to eat. Okay, balance and imbalance aren't enamics. Balance is the tertium quid, like becoming, and it's between two imbalances. Balance is this dynamic notion, unlike, um, I think, at least one way of interpreting Greek, the Greek, the Greek notion of the mean is that it's a static in the middle. If you think about the hitting the right note, if you think about courage as in being in between 